depending on the different industries, is AI going to kind of enable uh, the way the business is currently done or is it has the potential to completely disrupt the way business is being done? Before we dive in, we wanted to let you know also about another company in Chattanooga that's doing really great things, Reliance Partners. Reliance Partners is the latest sponsor of Freight Caviar, and they offer tailored insurance strategies for businesses of all sizes across the US, Canada, and Mexico. Reliance isn't just about compliance, they're about reducing costs and improving CSA scores, which means fewer audits and lower premiums. Their expert team with deep industry knowledge delivers substantial coverage at reasonable costs, offering options like self-insurance and captive programs. Rated America's fastest growing commercial insurance agency with top-notch customer service. Join thousands who trust Reliance Partners. Visit reliancepartners.com or call 877-668-1704 for your specialized quote today. And now let's dive in to this unique special episode. We're here at the Manifest Conference in Las Vegas. It's currently 4 p.m. on Tuesday, February 6th. And we have the co-founder and co-CEO of Shippers here. I'm a freight caviar, Christian and Michael Sahai. Michael, can you give us a short introduction of who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Excited to be on uh, today. And I think you're the only one who knows how to say my last name correctly. So th <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is um, Michael Sahai. I'm a, a partner at HPA. We're a investment group out of Chicago uh, th that's focused on investing in seed and Series A companies um, with a specific focus around where we have uh, great operator expertise. And so what's unique about our model is we've brought together a number of individuals who've had great success in growing, scaling, and exiting their own companies. And we've been able to leverage those individuals to work closely with our portfolio companies. And so everything from helping them find the right customers to help Helping them with their employees, thinking through their go-to-market strategy, um, but that advice coming from folks who've been there and done that before. Um, as we've grown and scaled, we've become one of the most active investors in Chicago, and we've been very active kind of in the broader logistics uh, space as well. And so we were early investors in both uh, Forkeis and ShipBob, which are both unicorns now in Chicago. Uh, and then more recently, I've made a number of investments um, uh, in logistics as well, uh, and then also investors in a wide variety of other industries. So excited to be here today. Definitely. So investments in logistics is something that I think a lot of people that maybe don't understand the VC world, PE world would like to learn more about. So I kind of want to simplify maybe the dialogue a little bit because I think most of our audience have like some kind of idea of what the VC world is like maybe, but I want to like kind of, you know, get, get in, help, help them understand. Demystify. Yeah, demystify, demystify the whole yeah, industry. Yeah. And uh, kind of, I'm curious, like, how did you get into, like, first of all, like, yeah. being in, in this VC world? Um, so, yeah, so the, the VC world is, is quite unique um, just because there are so few people actually involved with it. Um, most of the capital in the space obviously goes to investing in the startups. And so the number of employees managing uh, the world of venture is relatively small compared to other industries. Um, stats from a couple years ago is there was only about 5,000 people in venture itself. And that number has certainly grown, so that stat's a little bit old. Um, and the way I got involved was I always loved working with startups. And so from had launched a couple of different companies when I was in high school and in college, uh, took every single class that I could at Northwestern around startups, which was one. Uh, there was only one class at the time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, really, uh, it's been exciting to see how the ecosystem has grown and built. But, um, yeah, specifically, uh, was really excited to, to continue to work in the or to get involved with startups. And so uh, one of my close friends who had been backed by HPA, uh, when they were kind of looking for their first full-time hire to manage every aspect of the, the company, um, this is kind of how I initially got connected and, and uh, been there now, for, uh, been now with HPA for about 11 years. Okay. And uh, Kisan, you raised VC money I have, uh, yeah. back in the day. So you also have, uh, you know, knowledge and kind of experience working with VC firms. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, maybe you I want think, to add something. So I, I think one thing that I've noticed that was unique about uh, HPA was the, uh, the amount of people that uh, HPA, the amount of investors technically that HPA represents and the amount of experience that those people bring um, into the kind of the ecosystem or the portfolio that you guys invest into. Can you speak a little bit about 
how how some of those people have been helpful, maybe even like tailored specifically to logistics? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that uh, was kind of the foundational idea that we had as we really built up the organization was um, uh, in order to kind of really be able to provide the most value to a company is you need to have someone who's been there and done that before, but even within the industry itself. Um, and so specifically within the world of supply chain, we have a great number of folks from the world of Coyote Logistics and Schneider Electric. And there are folks who have had fantastic success growing and building their own companies. And now they're interested in being able to help the next generation of founders. And they do that kind of through the vehicle of our organization, because instead of it just being one individual, um, they've got a whole team of folks, both on our end, uh, as well as other investors that can look at the opportunity in different ways. And so uh, it's not necessarily just taking supply chain experts and helping supply chain companies. Uh, every single supply chain company as a tech company has product roadmaps. So we can sure. bring in technologists uh, that haven't necessarily built within supply chain, but know how to build a proper uh, build a proper roadmap as it relates to building a product. Um, and similarly with go-to-market and other things. But but yeah, that's become a kind of a key a key thing for us. And it's really built upon itself. And so all of these great operators that we work closely with, um, in addition to being exciting to work with the companies that they're supporting, are also looking forward to working with each other. Um, and uh, that's how we've built the organization over the past 10 years. Shout out to uh, uh, Eddie Leshin, which is also and, one of the uh, members of Hyde Park Angels. Yeah, uh, we've had Eddie on the oh. podcast before. Um, with the, the sheer, uh, there was the sheer logistics uh, yep, podcast. Yep. Um, that was so I've I've known Eddie for quite some time as well, and uh, people like Eddie uh, having that background and experience of you know a veteran operator um, can be like super helpful uh, when you're just entering the space of let's say you know you're you're wanting to start a logistics company like in my case in the very early days. I was very new to logistics, but somebody like Eddie coming along and, and providing that kind of guidance and grounding for where like maybe a tech entrepreneur may, you know, have their head in the sky sometimes. Uh, how how does how somebody like and Eddie like uh, and he, he brings so much knowledge. Uh, how has he helped you like maybe gone about like evaluating some of these companies, evaluating, helping these companies um, throughout? Well, you've been at HP for 10 years. Yeah. How, how, how yeah. that? No, I, I think that's a great example. Eddie is is uh, a fantastic uh, mentor, advisor, both to to the companies we work with, uh, as well as to myself and our team. And I think the you know the aspect of that is exactly kind of the points you highlighted. Is the you know when looking at logistics, there's so many different moving parts that I think there's been a lot of folks from outside the industry that say I've got a lot of technology expertise. I know how to build an app. I've got great AI expertise. I can solve this logistics no problem. And they don't understand just all the moving parts that come into it. Um, you know, and I know even, you know, Eddie has shared the examples of like, well, why isn't there an Airbnb for freight? Well, the dynamics of trying to place one, uh, you know, where you're going to go stay for a couple of days is very different when you're trying to place uh, place a load within a, 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 a within a trucking shipment, given there's so many other factors that are kind of associated with it. Um, and so it's interesting. I think, you know, Eddie's advice has certainly helped us make uh, great investments in companies like ShipBob and others. Uh, and then as well, I think it has helped us kind of see the challenges that the freight industry within tech and logistics has faced in the last couple last year or two, where we specifically didn't invest in those categories based on the great insights that Eddie had around the challenges within those models. Um, and so it's been both kind of helping us find unique opportunities to invest in, but also being able to see that, you know, even if there's a lot of venture capital dollars chasing certain ideas, that there's fundamental challenges in the industry that may prevent it from happening. Hey there, amazing listeners. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in our podcast, we need your support. It will only take a moment, but it would mean the world to us. Please make sure to hit the like button on this video, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to share with one of your friends that would enjoy our content. Your engagement helps us reach more people and bring more awesome episodes to you. Thanks a million, and thanks for being part of the podcast community. So I'm, gonna, I'm kind of curious, Michael. Um, I'll just say someone has a lot of money, and they obviously have the ability. They could invest in the stock market. They could buy real estate. They could invest in PE funds as well. How does it look like, let's just say, from a point of view, like, okay, I want to deploy some capital. I'm going to go, and I'm, I want to work with HPA. Like, how much capital do you need? How long is the timeline of when I will actually get a return on that capital, if anything? And what is the average return usually per year 
And can you compare that to the stock market? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as that goes, you know, also I think to the fundamental question of venture capital, so I can, I'll combo those two together. Um, you know, so the first part, just in the baseline of venture capital. So um, people like to compare, a good way to think about venture capital is similar to like how WWE is to uh, real wrestling. There's like a, there's, it's like played up. <laughs> it's a flavor. Flavor, yeah. Shark Tank and kind of what folks are familiar with Shark Tank is the, uh, you know, TV version of what's happening uh, in real life. Um, and so, you know, really at a fundamental level, it's companies that are at their at their earliest stages that have a lot of risk. You don't know if these companies are going to work or not. Um, and so how do you find an, uh, the right balance in terms of an investor being able to have some potential upside and then the, the founders actually getting capital to be able to grow the business? Yeah. And so the way that's done is through um, uh, in purchasing equity and, and having a stake in the company. And so this way, there's kind of an aligned incentive where if the company does really well and it goes to the stock market or, or gets bought by another company, um, then both the founder is, is making money and then the investors are making money. Uh, and then similarly, and you know, it's in a lot of cases for very early stage tech companies, if it doesn't work out, um, then you know, there's um, the investors are out of their capital and then the founders, you know, are going to go and look for something for something new. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, when comparison, it's it's a very unique market um, for both you know individuals from an investment perspective, as well as for corporations and institutional investors yeah. that put capital into into this venture capital space. Um, and there certainly is an element to it of uh, you're, if you're a large, a large institutional group, you're trying to diversify. You have investments in the stock market, you have investments in, in hedge funds and you have investments in private equity and, and all these places. Um, at the investor at the individual level, there's a couple of fundamental components. Uh, the first part is called an accredited investor. So, um, you know, groups like ours and, and venture capital in general is targeting individuals that have already a certain amount of capital and assets under management of, in their own personal lives so that they can take the risk associated with investing. Yeah. Because even as great as, you know, we are at HPA and, and other investors kind of around the ecosystem, we're still investing in, in a company with three people and a big idea. And so there's there's a lot of risk associated with that. Um, and so the way kind of our investors think about it, and I think a lot of investors that are investing personally into venture capital um, is they see it as both, obviously, they wanna be able to to grow their, their capital and be able to, um, uh, to make more money in the long run, but it's such a high level of risk and so much time that's required. I mean, even, you know, the work of Eddie supporting and mentoring all these companies yeah. that, that takes his, you know, takes time uh, out of his company sure. or out of his life. And so um, the reason folks do it is because there's also a kind of a higher calling as well, where folks help them out to kind of grow and build their, their business and, and their mm -hmm. lives in the early days. And so there's an element of giving back. And so there's, there's a mix of both like looking to, to be able to invest and, and make more cap and make more money in the long run, but also be able to kind of stay engaged. And I think the other part as well is specifically unique to HPA is folks want to be able to get to, um, know other folks in other industries and so um you know obviously eddie for example helps us a lot on the logistics side of things but through hpa has been able to invest in digital health companies and cybersecurity companies and consumer product goods companies that you know are he's excited to be a part of but he we're, we we're leaning on other people that have expertise in those verticals to help sure. us and yeah that's okay. basically just an excess he just has ac access to all these other people who have the same kind of level of qualifications as he does but just in other fields yeah and you can pick up the phone and ask somebody at any time right um what uh, so you, over these 10 years that you've been investing what would you say is like the kind of highest quality signals in when a founder comes in and pitches you um they maybe they're at the idea stage maybe maybe they're maybe a little bit farther along but what have you noticed about the qualities of the the really good teams, like the, yeah. the teams that actually ended up providing some level of return for the company, yeah. for, for HBA and its investors. Yeah, happy happy to cover that. I think the uh, there's two sides, I think, to the uh, two answers to that question. The first part is there's there certainly is elements of like pattern recognition within an industry or within uh, certain types of founders. But on the flip side, there's a lot of statistics and, and analysis that's gone into the world of venture. And all of them, I can give you examples of when we followed those statistics and the outcomes didn't work out. Okay. And then we didn't follow those statistics and the outcomes worked out great. Uh, so like one simple example is, you know, a best practice is as, as part of your co-founding team, 
uh, it is better to invest in a co-founding team versus a solo founder, statistically speaking. Some of our best uh, exits and companies, solo founders. Um, and so there's, you know, those are kind of just one example of it being kind of a, a bit different. Um, but like within that, the idea behind having multiple co-founders is folks that are bringing different things to the table. So someone with deep technical expertise, someone with deep sales expertise, being able to complement one another because at the earliest days, those folks are the only ones driving the business forward. Um, but I think, you know, one of the big things, um, you know, that's been interesting as we look at different companies is we, we think a lot about the value proposition. So at the earliest days when you don't have millions of dollars of revenue being generated from your customers and just try to figure out if someone's going to even pay you at all for this. Um, we do a deep dive through those industry experts to really be able to understand, um, you know, what is what is the current pain point in the market and how strong is that pain point to try to figure out if someone's going to pay you and change their behavior. There's kind of two components to it, obviously. A big company can go and pay you for your software, but if it is also going to require them to log in, to use it, to think about their business differently, and so the companies that are able to, you know, make it where one, the pain point is so extraordinarily high that people are willing to change their behavior and pay for it becomes the winning combination. And so, and it's interesting, you know, as, as we heard kind of throughout the manifest conference today, there's so many topics that are being discussed now that are like just on the precipice of being reviewed and, and perceived. And five and 10 years from now, it's going to be commonplace. And so, you know, years ago, there was a debate if e-commerce was going to have a, a, is going to become a big thing. Obviously, that's no longer a debate. People are very confident that e-commerce is, is, is a big aspect of our of our of of the industry and a big aspect of, of how people are going to buy and shop. Um, similarly, within, you know, within freight around visibility, there's a debate if you even needed to have like visibility at, at, a, at a third party level. Um, and now it's like, absolutely. Right. If you don't have it, what are you? And every other every other logistics conference is called has the word visibility in it. Right. Um, and so I think that those are the parts that we're trying to look at at the earliest days is in really kind of understanding um, uh, will behaviors change. And that's a very hard thing to, to prove out. And the reason why there's challenges and, you know, uh, uh, even the best VC funds have companies that go to zero and, and shut down yeah. is because it's in, like, even Google Ventures that has all the data in the world can't be can't get it right every time. So uh, I'm curious on that. Like statistically speaking, not talking about HP, I just, just statistically speaking on for like venture capital, how many companies actually succeed and yeah. how many like close? So uh, kind of the broad components are like if you think uh, one of the big things in venture capital is you want to invest in a portfolio of companies, because if you only invest in one company and you put all of your capital into just one, it's a, it's unlikely to be successful from an investor perspective. And so like the, the general statistics are if you invest in 10 companies, you probably expect anywhere from five to seven of them to um, either not return any capital or just get you your capital back. And then one or two of those get you hopefully somewhere between two to five times your capital back. And then it's not it's really not till the one or two, the remainder of that 10 where you get a, a crazy returns, 10, 20, 30, 50 times your, your capital yeah. back. And that makes up the blend across the ones that didn't work out. And that's typically because the company goes public, I'm guessing, at that kind of like level of it's, a return. It's yeah, certainly. I mean, public is, is one path. Uh, and then, you know, especially folks that, like if, if, when we're investing at the early stages, there's also just a lot of opportunities of companies getting acquired. Um, and so when you look at, um, you know, companies selling for hundreds of millions of dollars, if you invest at the earliest points, that still gives you an opportunity for a great return, both to you as the investors and to the founders. Sure. And um also in the venture capital world, you have funds, right? Yeah. You, and how many funds does HPA typically do a year? How much money is raised from, uh, do you raise it from individuals? Do you raise it from companies? Is it a com yeah. combination? And how many companies usually deploy it, it to? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the best way to kind of think of us just to compare ourselves apples to apples, we're approximately the size of a $75 million venture fund. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that over about every three years, we invest anywhere between uh, roughly around 25 companies. So over a three year period of time, we're investing in 25 new companies. And then obviously throughout that period of time, as the companies raise more capital, we're investing and in supporting them uh, into future raises. Okay. Got I think it. it's a, that's a unique thing about HPA, right? Is from my understanding, there, there have, hasn't been actual funds 
like fun yeah, one, fun our, two, fun three. It's it's different kind of in that way. But yeah. I think what we've been what we've done just to kind of be able to compare ourselves apples to apples sure. is because we want to be able to come. You know, our our investors have a lot of opportunities of where they could put their capital, and so we've done a lot to kind of uh, be able to to think in a similar way and kind of compare ourselves. Okay. But you're right; it's not it's uh, HP is not a traditional venture fund. It's so, unique in yeah. that way for sure. Um, what what types of companies? Uh, I'm you've seen probably thousands of pitches at this point. What types of companies should not be pitching for venture capital? Yeah, and it's a it's an interesting question because I think there's especially at the earliest days um, when founders are uncertain of how they're gonna you know do the basics and don't have their first customer and don't have revenue, venture capital becomes an appealing aspect of hey I can raise capital and it's not personal debt it's it's you know there's a, there'll be folks that it can help me. But I think, you know, uh, when it comes down to it, like there's a very specific set of expectations when you take venture capital dollars and those expectations largely fall around, you know, like what the total exit's going to be. So, for example, you know, if you're in an industry where, um, you know, companies are typically only selling for 10, 20 million dollars, it's going to be tough for an investor to put their capital into that, because if the best case outcome is only selling for 20 million you know, that's a, that's a big number, but if you're putting millions of dollars into the company, there's a bit of a mismatch in terms of the opportunity. And so I think the, uh, so that's one aspect. There's an element of just like the market size and just like the potential for an exit being not of the size and scale that a venture capitalist needs in order to make it make sense. Um, because from a venture capitalist perspective, they're looking at thousands of companies. And if there's one chance where they could, the you know, in a best case outcome, they could sell their company for, for $2 billion, and then another company, best case outcome, selling it for twenty million. Obviously, the investors got to look at the ones that have that outcome. Yeah. Um, but the you know the other part to it, I think, is um, you know even within the operators that we work with at HPA, there are folks that have had great success that were in markets and had aspects where they could have raised venture capital, but they decided to go the route of taking customer revenue and putting that back into the business. And it took them longer by by definition, you know, venture capital becomes a, a way to expedite your your growth. It's like jet fuel. Right. Yeah. But on the flip side, you know, they've had great exits and they had 100 percent of the return and they did it their way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, I think there's uh, companies have a lot of choices in terms of thinking about it. So it's not you have to raise venture or you don't have to raise venture. There's a question of like what you want to do as a founder, how you want to grow your business. Do you want to have someone in the boardroom that that's helping kind of direct the, the business? Um, and sometimes the answer is no, uh, and that and that you know is completely fine. Sure. So, Michael, I'm curious about the story behind Four Kites. Yeah, because you're one of the HPO is one of the earlier investors. How did that come about? What stage did you invest in Four Kites? And how have you seen the company grow? Can you tell us all about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know the story of Forkites is an especially exciting one, just because uh, yeah, we were the part part of the original round of investors that invested into the company, like when, seed, seed round, pre seed round. So oh, wow. when it was okay. just it was just uh, Matt and his co founder. It was just two employees. <laughs> okay. Uh, zero customers, zero revenue. Wow. Um, and I think you know, um, and also got to know it was you know I think. Part of the interest for venture capitalists is to get to know the founders and, and kind of work with them. And so, you know, Matt uh, was working out of uh, there was a co-working space in Chicago called 1871. Uh, and so he was working out of one of the offices where it wasn't even his office. He just had one seat yeah. and HBA was a smaller firm, too. And so we were working just out of one seat um, down the hallway from one another. And wow. so both kind of, you know, HBA was at its earliest days as well. What kind year of was, building. This? was that what year was this? Uh, 2013. 2013. Okay. Uh, around that time. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think it was interesting as, as we got to know Matt and kind of see the opportunity, you know, there was that question and debate around visibility and, and question of would, uh, is this something that third party customers are going to want to do or third party is going to do, or is it something that companies are going to do in house or at all? Uh, yeah, that, that, that that was, it was very uncertain back in 2012, 2013, like basically pre ELD, if you right. mentioned visibility, people were definitely kind of like cross-eyed, uh, kind of what are you talking about oh yeah and and you know as we were doing like reference calls and trying to get input from the market there certainly were folks telling us that you know they're never going to allow anyone to track their trucks um and so you know as we kind of looked at the opportunity saw a couple things one was there was an element that in a couple years there was um legislation that was going to mandate it 
And, you know, certainly a risk for us because there's, I used to work for the Department of Defense. It, you have no guarantee of any of these things That's ever happening. It's, yeah. So it's possible people are thinking about it, but it may never come. Um, so there's an element of like regulation may help move the business forward. And that would create an interesting opportunity where suddenly everyone needs it and needs to find a solution. Um, and then, you know, the other part as well, in, in terms of working with Matt, you know, as he was building the company, he would kind of help share like what he was focused on doing and like how he was thinking about putting the plan together. And as he would come back and kind of give updates, um, he did what he was saying he was going to do, which is like, you know, in a very minor way of just getting the, the ball started or getting the ball rolling. But, um, but yeah, it was just kind of interesting to see him kind of grow and build. And so, um, yeah, no, that's kind of the, the early story of us kind of getting involved and, and working with Fortkites. But I think it's interesting as well of like how, how much the venture capital ecosystem has changed. I think if, if there was a conference like Manifest 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been many folks because, again, 10 years ago, there was even a debate if venture capital should be invested into the logistics yeah. industry. Um, and so uh, it's been fun just to kind of see the ecosystem grow and build and uh, for companies like Forkites and ShipBob and others uh, to be able to really be able to make a mark in the world of logistics and, and make a mark in Chicago as well. It's it's interesting how the, there was like this step function change uh, basically in the broader market, meaning that once the government came in and changed a law that said, hey, this is what the industry is going to have to do. That is essentially when all of the venture capital started to pour, from what I remember, like yeah. billions of dollars started pouring into the visibility providers, the ELD providers. And that's really when freight logistics as a whole started to get the attention of VCs. Because prior to that, it was. Yeah, not there, that big. there was a big debate. And it was a debate of if people would spend money on it. Yeah. There was a debate of a variety of like if people would use it. And it's interesting to see how different industries have evolved because, like, Obviously, there's uh, in a variety of different industrial um, industries, uh, there's been a lot of venture capital that's gone into it, but some have had more success than others. And even if you just look purely at adoption. So in in well, trucking logistics, there's a much higher adoption rate than in other industries where um, there's just been a, a challenge to get um, to get all the employees and get everyone like on the grassroots levels actually will use technology instead of going back to pen and paper or whatever, whatever way that, that used to be done. Um, but yeah, no, there were certainly a number of kind of catalysts. And I think you know, legislation was some of that, um, companies having budgets to actually start investing into technology was it, and then it becoming a competitive advantage where if you didn't have technology, suddenly you were being left behind. So, in terms of four kites, uh, you said that you, they are a unicorn now. For anyone that doesn't know, a unicorn means they just are valued at over a billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, how did that look like from a time frame perspective? Like, so in 2012 or 2013, yeah. HPA invested pre seed round. Yeah. What series are they at right now? Um, it's I, at, <laughs> at, at this point, yeah, it's hard to say yeah. at this point. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think, um, you know, a little bit of the history. So, I mean, I think the, um, I forget what year they, you know, kind of crossed that. And that was like, you know, a big announcement mm -hmm. and an exciting opportunity in Chicago because there aren't, weren't that many unicorns at the time kind of within, within Chicago. Um, but, you know, it certainly is a long journey. I think, you know, it probably took at least, you know, six, seven years um, and multiple rounds of financing and tens of millions of dollars, um, partnerships with different corporate groups and kind of, uh, you know, finding the right balance of all those components. And so, I think, you know, that the other part of, you know, the earlier questions around founders and if you want to raise venture capital, like, you know, a venture fund is structured that we don't anticipate a return for 10 years because that's yeah. how long it takes a company to grow. And certainly um, in between that, there's companies that won't work out. And so you already know those are, are going to be a zero. There's other ones that will be in that two to five times return. And then for the really big opportunities, uh, it takes a long time because they continue to grow and build market share. Um, and so that's uh, that's the you know the long term vision, long term play that we have to to work towards. Sure. What are you currently eyeing in terms of like or or VCs in general in the logistics industry like to invest in? Because I mean, visibility, four yeah. guides, other visibility visibility players already got a lot of raises. Uh, what opportunities are you looking at right now? Yeah. So obviously, like with with everything being AI and AI being mentioned hundreds of times, you know, at, at the conference as well, 
you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to think about where AI plays within the world of logistics, uh, as well as all the other industries that we invest in. And, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the factors that we try to think about is, um, depending on the different industries, is AI going to kind of enable uh, the way the business is currently done or is it has the potential to completely disrupt the way business is being done? And there's an important distinction because if it's going to completely disrupt it, then we have to be very thoughtful of where we're investing capital because if we're investing in a part of the industry where in three to five years, AI will completely replace what they're doing, um, then that company from day one better be thinking and managing to that AI strategy. Yeah. And then there's other parts of the industry and, you know, all across logistics and supply chain where, um, you know, when you look at um, maintenance and repairs, there's a lot of technology that can be enabled within that part of the industry, mm -hmm. but AI will not replace it completely sure. because it's still a physical thing. There's folks that are building, fixing, and, and kind of working yeah. on these parts. Um, but there's elements where AI would be able to enable it, make it easier, make it more efficient, be able to start planning ahead and figuring out when you're going to have maintenance issues. Um, but there it becomes a big kind of distinction between the two. Sure. Uh, what positions do you believe will AI replace? Yes. I mean, I think uh, the most interesting thing when when everyone first started talking about AI, I think people started jumping way ahead in terms of thinking about what it could be. It's interesting if you look at where the applications are now and where a lot of companies, bigger companies are kind of initially using it. Surprisingly, a lot of initial use cases is around customer service and around helping helping folks navigate the platform. And so I think the at least, you know, in, in certain parts of, of the ecosystem, the areas around customer service, being able to help your customer move faster, get a quicker response time, get a more dynamic response. Um, it's like an easy place because you have, it's baked, it's baked within the ecosystem of that platform where obviously the AI bot would know everything about that, a route about that particular um, company and product mm -hmm. and could help folks navigate it. And so I think that's going to be, if you look across all the companies that have announced like uh, larger platforms that have announced AI aspects of their business, mm -hmm. large portion of it uh, initially starts out with how do we make the platform more accessible? How do we help get folks the answers more quickly? Um, and so that becomes like, it's looking to become table stakes where in a very short period of time, if you have it enabled kind of AI to be able to just make your customers' lives easier at the baseline mm -hmm. uh, that you already will be behind. Sure. So the, so obviously given this um, kind of advent of all these language models, large language models, there, I saw a company um, called uh, Zero Broker um, that was funded kind of based, I think the name implies maybe what they're going for. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether or not that's going to be possible, whether you can completely eliminate, you know, yeah. all of the kind of human related aspects of the, of the logistics business. What, what, what's your take on like, do you think or maybe part of the HPA community has an opinion on it too, from what you've heard, are there certain jobs that like, you know, won't be replaceable? Yeah. Um, at least in the freight, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, across the board, there's always been a perception in different industries and in different parts of like, hey, technology may completely replace X, Y, Z. Like years ago, there was a percep perception in the world of um, insurance that you could completely remove the broker, that you could have a very streamlined process, you could have a digital uh, underwriting component, and that you would never, you can completely you know, remove the middleman was the concept. Uh, and what's been proven across multiple parts within the insurance industry is that those brokers are an incredibly critical component. Um, and so all the big uh, insurance plays have stopped trying to replace and figure out how do you partner and how do you work. And so I think similarly, even as you look at like um, uh, within specifically within logistics and around this aspects of customer service, um, there's a concept within AI of human in the loop where the AI does some of it and then the human does other aspects to it. And that's sometimes to check on what the AI is doing uh, and then other parts just because it's doing a handoff. And I think that's the part that those are the parts that are going to be there where there will always be nuances to, to aspects of where, you know, AI will have a limitation or even how a company wants to be able to best service their customers. You know, if, if you're one of the largest customers for that particular um, startup, they're not going to get put all of their eggs in that basket and worry about if they're servicing their customer the best. And so I think um, there will always be room in different parts. And I think the question just becomes, you know, how how far into it does it? Is it replace 80%, 50%, 20%? Um, 
uh, or does it just, you know, the other idea is always you can, by, uh, by making that portion of the business more efficient, you can now leverage those individuals to spend more time on higher value tasks. So instead of always just trying to figure out an invoice number or some like basic issue, let the AI bot deal with that one and then use the highly talented folks that you have to be able to focus on the the more critical and kind of more complex issues. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, I just wanted to add that yesterday I was flying with uh, next to Matt Silver on the flight from Chicago to Vegas. And he said that, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't see freight forwarders, freight brokers going anywhere. Uh, he just sees technology allowing these positions to become be more efficient. And he wrote a whole newsletter about it yesterday. And I do agree with that. I, I think that having that service aspect, like a shipper just wants to have it off their plate. They don't want to deal with it. They also don't want to have to hire, uh, you know, inside of their company's logistics, uh, you know, broker, stuff like that. So they just outsource it. So I don't I don't see that leaving the industry anytime soon. Technologies will make the positions more efficient so they could work on more high value tasks. Uh, that's also my opinion. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I see it um, over the long period, uh, maybe 15 years, 20 years from now, if we kind of extrapolate where things are going, uh, it's very difficult to predict what things will look like based on the rate of improvement and change. Um, so I, I have a slightly different opinion, but in the short term, 10, 15 years, yeah, it's going to be more of an augmentation of people's work and decreasing bottom line costs, right? Yeah. Have you seen, so have you seen in your portfolio companies, any of the companies that actually have deployed AI in their customer service, um, you know, customer support, uh, that their bottom line, you know, their costs, costs have actually decreased or have, or in the inverse, like have, has the revenues increased just simply by employing these AI models? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, probably for uh, our larger companies, it's still uh, TBD because they've just launched in the last you know six months or so. Um, I do think like in different industries, there's like interesting applications of it though, because um, like in the world of education, now students are trying to use AI and chat GPT to make it easier for them to do their schoolwork. Well, now startups are trying to make it, figure out if you use chat GPT to do it. So AI right. bots fighting AI bots to, yeah. to kind of figure <laughs> things out. Um, and so I think there will be kind of interesting applications, um, but it, it does feel like it's a little too early to say, you know, uh, the idea that like you're removing your customer service department because the AI bot is so perfect. Um, it's not something that we've really kind of heard or seen yet. Yeah. Fair enough. Very yeah. interesting. Uh, Christian. How, how crazy of a world would it be if like uh, the AI, like the sales reps, they were, let's say they were like um, automated AI models and one company starts using them starts working but then another start company starts using it as well and then you have like this <laughs> really weird feature where ai models are like just talking to each other and i don't know exactly know but there was like a thought experience th thought experiment that i was having with a friend the other day like what is a what does a world like that look actually look like you yeah know, well and there's there's been funny examples of that online of like having siri talk to google and, and like them yeah. fighting it out between <laughs> each other and answering questions um but no it's an interesting thing yeah in the future i mean it, that may just be the next version of like the way we think about API calls where you have one data moving between the other and in the future, it's just two bots figuring it out. But it's it's still a little while away for that. It's, it's still a while away. But it's like as to, to the topic of the API calls. Like I think that in the long term, phone or even maybe fax, maybe not fax, but phone and like text and email will make an even bigger comeback. I mean, it's still a dominant way to like transfer information between companies. But this fact that like you can provide unstructured information from one one source to another and parse it without having any description of an API, right? right? It's that that's where I think things are going to get quite interesting. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over like the next ten years. Yeah, well, and every industry is going to have to figure out their own version of it because like healthcare is heavily regulated and there's very specific rules of what kind of data can move. And then, you know, even in less regulated industries, people are very thoughtful around the, the different aspects. And so, you know, even obviously technology, there's elements, especially in logistics around trust, where if I'm going to give you this data, I have to trust that you're using it in the right way. Right. And so, um, yeah, it will be interesting to kind of see how it evolves and grows. So just to wrap it up here, Michael, uh, I'm curious, you come to Manifest, we met at Manifest at last year. We did, uh, like, I know you met Christian years yeah. before that, but... Uh, what are you coming here for? What are you looking for? And what do you hope to get out of the conference? Yeah. Um, no, I think, you know, last year's uh, experience with Manifest was was fantastic, a really kind of exciting way to see the ecosystem coming together. 
Um, and so, you know, uh, was I knew before I even left Manifest last year that I was going to be coming back this year. And, and similarly, you know, excited to be back next year. And, you know, I think this year, looking and seeing how everything's pretty much 2X in size and people and all that sort of stuff, it took me a while to realize there's actually two two separate yeah, rooms uh, for all, all this stuff here. Um, but I think it's, it's exciting to connect with, you know, new and up and coming founders, connect with our portfolio companies, multiple of which are here today are here at the conference. Uh, and then as well as of meeting other investors and kind of seeing the way that they think about where the market's headed and similar thought experiments that, that you guys are having on, on your side of things. Investors are trying to figure it out as well. No one's got yeah. the, the crystal ball. Yeah. Let's just say someone's listening and they're like, oh, I have a great idea. I want to, I want to need some investors. Should they reach out to you, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we try to make, yeah, I think venture as a whole tries to make it, you know, easy to, to get in front of folks. I think uh, it's very different than like an enterprise system where like you're going through RFP processes or anything of that sort. So, uh, you know, we, we always try to be very accessible uh, to folks. And so, um, yeah, they're certainly feel free to, you know, reach out on LinkedIn or email. Um, and then we try to be very, you know, forthcoming as well. I think uh, as founders go and fundraise, they realize that, you know, the stat is it takes you about 50% of your time to raise capital. So about six months and 50% of your time to raise capital. And so, you know, I think one of the things that we try to do and other investors do as well is just to be, if it's if it's kind of a fit for where, you know, we, we may be good partners, we want to work quickly and figure that out. And then similarly, if it's not going to be a fit, we want to let you know that as quickly as possible so you could go talk to other investors. That's fine. Love that. Awesome. Well, Christian, any other questions? No, this is this is great. Thank you, uh, thank you, Michael, for coming on. And yeah, yeah. anything, Michael, you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, no, just uh, thank you, guys. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know we've been investing in logistics for a long period of time, but I think even as I've uh, personally get more involved in trying to understand the the ecosystem, things like Frank Caviar have been a great kind of opportunity through that, both from your memes and from your articles. And so, you know, thank you guys as well to all the things you've done to help kind of break the barriers within the community, so folks get more involved and, and know what's happening in the world of uh, freight and logistics. Of course, awesome. thank you, Michael. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Daily Freight Caviar Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, or if you didn't, leave a review. Let me know what you think. I appreciate any feedback. If you'd like to have more Freight Caviar content, go to FreightCaviar.com and subscribe to my email newsletter.